All right, I think now it's working, recording, okay? Well, we take a big risk. <laughs> now, to know what is Jensen Alpha, it's, I want to give you an example, which is a non-financial example. Uh, I'm your teacher and you're my students. I will evaluate you at some stage. At the end of the course, I will do the course evaluation. And then I'll be giving you grades according to your performance. The grades will be varying from zero to five. I'll be using two theories to give you grades. The one is that I would be comparing your performance with the institution's benchmark. For example, in YAM, we have a system that if you get 55 to 64, you get one credit. If you get uh, 65 to 74, you get two. If it is 75 to 84, it's, no, 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 it's zero to 54. No, no, if you're below 44, less than 45, you get zero. If it is 45 to 54, you get one. 55 to 64, you get two. 65, 74, you get three. 75, 84, you get four. 85 and above, you get five. All right, that's one comparison. It's an external comparison. The one comparison which I will always keep in my head is I'll be comparing you with yourself. Do you get my point? For example, when I do the assessment and when I see, okay, now this is the exam script of this girl and I have it in front of me, immediately her face will pop up in front of me. And I would say, hey, I think before I check, I think she deserves these many grades because that's what she has been. She has been doing great job in the class, but not the best job. So in my head, I'm thinking of giving her a three. And then when I, when I look at her assignments, her exams, scripts and everything, wow, I'm, I'm amused. She has done a great job. My theoretical grades were three. My estimated or my, the grades based on my perception were three, but the grades which she actually have secured are five. She overmet my expectation. The difference between what she has got and what was expected out of her is called Jensen's Alpha in finance. If Jensen Alpha is positive, it means that what you perform is more than what was expected out of you. And there might be some student who otherwise are doing great job in the class. They are always discussing, discussing things in the discussion forum, in the class, hyperactive. And I have a hunch that these, this student will get five definitely. But when I check the exam, there are some silly mistakes. So in that case, your actual performance could be below or your theoretical expected performance. So in that case, Jensen Alpha is negative because your performance is less than what was expected out of you. The same thing we do in finance. When I invest in a company, I calculate an expected return that, hey, this is the minimum, this is the floor. This is the floor I must get. This is the minimum I must get. That is called theoretical performance, right? But then I check, that is my before investing benchmark, you know? Like, like for example, have you seen the high jump? We have a bar. Anybody who is jumping over the bar, one thing's for sure that the person has jumped at least, it doesn't matter, he jumped by one centimeter above the bar or one foot or one meter. As long as you jump over the bar, you have met the expectation. 
But the moment you touch the bar, or the moment you're below the bar, what happens? The bar falls. And when the bar falls, the referee comes and he gives a red flag. It means this jump is a foul jump. It's not counted. You get my point? This exactly is done by Jensen Alpha. Jensen Alpha is positive. If the referee is giving you a white flag, jump is legal, legitimate, accepted. Jensen Alpha is negative. If the flag is red, which means that you have jumped below the height of the bar. That's what we do in finance. Okay. The question is that where this bar comes from, who fixes the bar? Well, the bar is fixed by a very important theory in finance called capital asset pricing model. CAPM, C-A-P-M, Capital Asset Pricing Model. This is in your slides. Mm -hmm. If you see the slides, let me show you. Uh, okay. Let me download it actually. So here the bar, let me see if I can share the screen with you. Uh, yes. So capital asset pricing model, which I actually ask you to study by yourself, uh, is, the, is a bar setting model, which tells us that we should set the bar. Capum. CAPM um, is a very important theory. CAPM has won, by now, till now, CAPM has won three Nobel Prize in economics till date. Harry Markovich won Nobel Prize first time in CAPM, and then subsequently people developed CAPM, they made some changes in CAPM, some, and so far, as I said, CAPM has won three Nobel Prizes in economics. It was introduced by John Lintner, uh, Trainer Sharp, and then eventually Markovich is the one who, who uh, yeah, Sharp uh, won the Nobel Prize in, 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 in economics along with Merton Miller and Harry Markovich. So the, the three economists, they were given a joint. But even after these three economists, there have been some changes in CAPM subsequently, and two more Nobel Prizes have gone to this theory. This is a very important theory. And the idea of this theory is this. Look at this equation. Only this equation and three Nobel Prizes in economics. And CAPM model sets the bar. How we set it? Look at the formula. RF, risk-free rate of return. Who offers you risk-free rate? Is anything risk-free in life, in, especially in finance? Hmm? Well, the 10-year treasury bond bill, uh, uh, the rate that you get is a risk-free rate. I remember in one of the previous lectures, I took you to Suomi Panki, this, the Bank of Finland's website, and I showed you that it, it was about 0.5%. Risk-free rate, which the state treasury gives you, or the central bank gives you. The return is very low because the risk is almost zero. The only time you lose money is that when the treasury of the state becomes bankrupt. When a country default, otherwise, you will definitely get 0.5% in Finland. The probability of the Finnish economy going bankrupt is uh, remotely, it's not, it doesn't exist. Well, it's possible, but not probable. 
right? You get my point? Plus beta. Now, you know all what beta is. Beta is a measure of systematic risk. And then you have multiplied by RM, R subscript M. What is that? The market rate of return. Mm -hmm. While you calculate beta, you must have calculated RM first. Otherwise, you can't do it. How do you find beta? You have the company stock return and the index stock return. Is it so? So the index return is a market return. RM minus RF again. And then that gives you the minimum rate of return, which, mark my words, the minimum rate of return which an investor must get, must in capital letters. This is the minimum return which I must, so before I invest in a company, I should have used CAPM to calculate what should I get minimum from this. That you get from each company is not the same. Look at the components. RF would be same for the whole country. RM can be same for the all companies in a given market, but the difference comes beta. Beta makes the difference. And because of this beta, your minimum cost of equity, which you must get, changes. And that sets the bar. You know, in the, in the high jump example, when you jump in the first round, let's say the bar is uh, 1.2 meters. And then when those people who qualify, then the bar is raised. And you go higher and higher and higher. Right? It means what? It means that as the betas of the company go up over time, the bar is raised up. And if the beta of the company goes down, then the minimum return which you must get declines. Why declines? Because risk goes down, simple. Risk, return, go hand in hand. No pains, no gains. When the pain goes down, means the risk goes down, why should you get more return then? But when the risk goes up, which means the beta goes up, then uh, the return which you must get, I'm, I'm emphasizing the word must get. It's not should get. It's not a matter of choice. You must get. Imagine I calculate return of a company historically last five, six years. And I find that the based on uh, their beta, uh, this uh, capum, it's 5%. Yeah, right? 5% is something which I must get. But when I find the recent performance, or I see the company is undergoing huge structural changes, there's some crisis in the company, and I have no reason to believe that I would be getting 5%. I would never invest in that. If I'm still investing it, I'm putting my shareholders' money at risk. It means I'm not a bad manager. Hence, the company's governance is very, very poor. Right? So the CAPM sets the bar, basically. Should you invest? Shouldn't you invest? Depends on CAPM. Well, there are many other models, but CAPM till date is the most widely used uh, model of benchmarking, keeping a floor, keeping a minimum uh, you know, height, the minimum return, which you must get. Okay? I repeat, if you look at the formula of uh, cost of equity, you find that there is a three-tier comparison. I compare a, a company's performance with the risk-free rate of return. Plus, I compare the company's performance to the market rate of return. And by comparing, by adding these two components, I end up comparing you or the company with the company itself. This is the beauty of Jensen's Alpha. All right, make sense? But now we shall do, and one more thing, uh, as I said before, Jensen Alpha is, we get 
Jensen Alpha is the difference between the company's actual performance and the mark and 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 the theoretical performance. This formula is giving you a theoretical performance. If your actual performance is more than theoretical performance given by Capum, your Jensen Alpha is positive, which means that you have overmet the expectations of investors. And if your actual performance is less than the theoretical performance, hence your Jensen Alpha is negative, it means you have disappointed investors. And as I wrote here, 6% uh, could be higher for one company, but 6% could be a disappointment for another company, thanks to systematic risk. Thanks to systematic risk. On the next calculation I, I'll be doing on the board, but how we calculate these theoretical uh, return and the actual return and how we make the formulation of Jensen Alpha, all right? Uh, if you see the board, Maybe I'm not sure if, if I can show it, but you just focus on the board. Uh, let's say this is the actual performance of the company, yeah? And this is the theoretical performance. Right? Uh, if I say so, the expected return of the company is is a function of market, RM. Do we agree? Remember you have been doing alpha. You are calculating, sorry, beta. Were you? How do you calculate beta? Beta is a slope of the company return over the market return. And let's imagine that the company's return is symbolized as RA and RM is the market return, okay? And we use the regression in that case, regression line, you know the straight line. It means that RA would be equal to alpha plus RM. Do you all agree with this or not? Do you all agree with this or not? RA, which means the company's return is a function of alpha. What is alpha? Intercept. Huh? Y, I'm not using X, Y, I'm using those symbols so that we, and alpha is a intercept and RM is the market return. If you want to see, I can show quickly to you. So RA and the RM market return. This is how you can do alpha and this is called beta. Do you know that? We have done many times now this thing. So that's why I'm saying RA is a function of RM. That's why alpha and beta RM comes from. I can write again, RA is equal to alpha plus beta RM, right? This is the actual return. This is how we calculate the actual return. And then comes the theoretical return. That is given by Capum. And how do you find it? RA is equal to uh, RA plus beta RA minus RA. Do you all agree or not? I just wrote beta. Uh, I just wrote this equation here. All good? Yeah. Now, the rule of mathematics say, the algebra say that this side and this side is equal. Yeah. So I can say that alpha plus beta Rm in between lines Rf plus beta Rm minus beta. Do you know what I've done? I just multiplied beta with the terms inside the bracket and just multiplied them. You're fine? Beta RM is here. 
beta rm is here both are having same sign what will happen to them they will cancel out each other okay because when you cross the equation it becomes plus becomes negative so plus minus cancels so we have this minus this goes with what are we left with alpha and here we are left with beta Mm -hmm. We have alpha in between. There is a something. I, I just leave this line like this. Beta times 1 minus Rf. Now, if alpha is more than beta, Your Jensen alpha will be positive. Hence, you have overmet expectation. If this is more than this side, look, this side is representing actuality. This side is representing theory, expectation. If this side is more than this equation, beta times one minus Rf, you have overmet expectation. Hence, Jensen's alpha is positive. If both sides are equal, then your Jensen's alpha is zero, which means you got exactly what was expected out of you. If this side is smaller than this side, then Jensen alpha is negative, implying that you have performed below your expectations. Okay, so this is not Jensen alpha. The difference between this side and this overall side, that is Jensen alpha. Even though we can call it alpha, but this is not Jensen's alpha. Jensen's alpha is a difference between this side and this side. And actuality is here, the theory is this. So that speaks itself, that if you have, uh, if the difference between these two sides, left side minus right side is positive, uh, then Jensen alpha is good. That's what I expect. You have done a good job, right? Okay, make sense? or not. This is the actual return function as we get with the straight line equation. This is the CAPM determined equation. CAPM represents the theory. And the difference between the two uh, would be determining if you have beaten the market or if, uh, sorry, if you have, look, it was my spontaneous reaction that if you have beaten the market, if you look at the previous example, the company Y have beaten the market 6%. Do you know this, this, this number? Look at them. If this company Y gets 6%, delivers 6%. 6% is more than 5%. You have beaten the market but you are beaten by the expectation from you. Have you got my message or not? Imagine this company Y actually gets it. Apparently, you beat the market, but that's not enough. I'm comparing you with the market, then, then it's fine. But when I compare you with you, you disappointed me. That is Jensen Alpha. When I compare this company, let's say this company gets 3.5%. Actually, this 3.5% is below the market. Market has beaten you. But when I compare you with yourself, I'm happy. Because I was expecting less from you, but you have overmet my expectation. That, that's the message. That's the message of Jensen's Alpha. Okay. All right. Now, see this. 
Um, in this example that you can see in the in this spreadsheet, you see that the risk-free rate uh, risk-free rate of return in UK is four percent, right? It's given. I have taken it. It's not a formula. And then I have the BP stock return, which means the company's stock return. Okay. And then I find the FTSE return, which means uh, the market stock return, the market's return, basically, index return. And then I find beta, and beta is negative, by the way, in this case. Right? I took uh, just a few years, maybe one or two years, so that just a, for the sake of example. Remember, uh, risk free rate is 4%, and beta is minus, so it's almost zero B. And then we go down. And remember, these are uh, stock returns, not the stock price. Never, never start calculation with the stock price. If you do it, you are entering in a very dangerous territory. All right? Complete, complete disaster. Stock return, market return. And then what we do, I have done this calculation at the bottom. Here I find the average, average return, because see what, I need to find the, uh, some, somewhere I need to find the average, one figure. Look, I'm taking data for two years or one year, I don't know, but how many? Yeah, it's even, it's, it's only 65 observations. So I think it's a, just a few months data, all right? Uh, a few months is not enough, but I'm just doing it for the sake of doing it, all right? But if you do it for the multiple years, then that observation would be more. But the idea is that I take one return, average return, average company return, average, average market return. And then guess what I do? I calculate Jensen Alpha, right? I have done Jensen Alpha in two ways. This way, this Jensen Alpha is the way I do this thing. But this Jensen Alpha, I do again. Can you see Jensen Alpha is coming again? This is the way I do. This is the CAPM return. This is the CAPM determined return. And this is the actual, sorry. This is the actual return. Oh, sorry, what did I do? This is the actual return, which is this, by the way. You see, this is the same as this. This is the CAPM determined return, and this is the actual return, and see the difference. Difference is 0 0.15986, which is same here. But here I use the formula like this, but here I calculated separately and then found a difference. Either way, it's same, it doesn't matter. So basically, what we found here is Jensen Alpha is 15.98%, nearly 16%, which is positive. It means that the company has met its expectation by a margin of 16%. You overperformed 16%. It's a success. It was expected that you will be producing a return of 3.99%, nearly 4%. Whereas you end up producing a return of 20%, nearly. And the difference is nearly 16%. So you have overperformed by it. This is Jensen Alpha. The market return was only 4%. You could have beaten the market only by securing something a little, little bit more than 4.01%. Uh, but then you have, in this case, you not only have beaten the market, but also beaten the expectations from you. And Jensen Alpha is a difference between what you perform and what was expected from you, simple. Make sense or not? Yeah. 
Sorry? C2? Uh, C2 is a uh, risk free rate, RF. RF. Well, RA is the company return, which I expect. So, for example, in this case, uh, wait a sec. Uh, this is RA, 19%. This is the actual return. Here, again, this RA, but this is expected return. A could be the name of the company. In this case, A is BP. So I can call RBP, whatever. So here, I'm using A here, the symbol. But in this case, for example, the name of the company is BP. So A is only the name of the company. That's it. And you can also find Jensen Alpha of your full portfolio. Because what is portfolio? Portfolio is a collection of stocks. But once you form the portfolio, that one become a standalone stock itself. So you can also find the Jensen Alpha of your portfolio, one portfolio. So calculate the portfolio return, actual return, okay? And then find the CAPM return of the portfolio. If you see the portfolio stock return, you just put the weights of different stocks and then find out one, one single column, don't you? Just like a stock itself. So you, can, you don't have to calculate Jensen Alpha for each company separately. Well, you can if you wish to show it, but in this task, uh, in the task which you'll be doing, you can create the portfolio first and then find out Jensen's Alpha. That will make your life easy. Unless you want to show each company separately. Yeah, is it fine? Are you convinced with this? So you use this formula or this formula, it doesn't matter, the same. What next we have? And one more thing uh, I would say that uh, don't forget to annualize it, right? Annualization, can you see here? You can see that here Jensen's alpha um, of the company was um, how much? 0 0.10%, 0 0.10%, which means 1% um, could have been this, 0 0.01. Anyways, that's that's not a big deal. The big deal is that you are able to calculate it. That's more important. Now, this topic, which we start now, um, is the leverage and the firm valuation. The leverage is that how the debt debt play an important role in the company's valuation. If you want to find the company's value or the company's performance, how much is the impact of debt on it? And it's a very important topic and it's very much um, you know, contemporary uh, topic. Uh, this is called regression beta. I just want to have a quick recap before we go to the topic as such. Uh, you know, in, in finance, it's very important to know the different names of the same phenomena. Right? We have one beta called regression beta. Can you find regression beta here somewhere in this, on this board white chart? Can you see the regression beta somewhere? Look at this 
chart where is regression beta sorry there this is regression beta because this is the regression line remember the line slope and the intercept okay regression beta is also called equity beta equity beta and the regression beta are the same thing and the beta which you calculate first of all is the regression beta like all the betas which you must have calculated by now i expect that you would have done some beta calculation by now they all are regression beta equity beta or they are also called levered beta look at three names of the same thing equity beta i can write it down here the beta levered beta or regression Are you with me? Equity levered regression beta. In fact, the beta which you see in the headline is also equity levered or regression beta. The beta you either calculate by yourself or you see in some website, don't you? You get my point or not? But this beta, even if you see in the web site. even that beta is equity equity levered or regression same have you seen the beta published beta ever have you or have you, have you not have you or have you not no for example uh let me see if i'm sharing this page but anyways if i go to reuters Reuters is a good resource of um, headline beta, um, and if I search for, if I, what can I find here? Hmm. Am I missing something? Where is that? Uh, let's say markets, the U.S. markets, for example. If I want to, why can't I find? You know, there there should be a search thing where I can search something. I can type in something. Uh. this beta 1.31 did you calculate or did you see it in the headline in the published website even this beta is the equity slash levered slash regression beta so the point i'm trying to make is that all the betas which you have dealt with so far either calculated or seen in the website or equity slash regression slash levered beta why are they called equity because they are about the equity of the company these are calculated based on stock return equity stock regression beta why because we have used regression technique even these yahoo or the google people even they have done this technique and why it's called levered beta that is very important while calculating this beta the company those people who cal 
calculate this beta, they keep in mind that company has borrowed money. This beta incorporates the company's short-term and long-term borrowings. So this beta is reflection of company's debt. You get my point? This beta is based on the company's debt. This includes the effect of the debt on the company, of the company. But then, uh, I'll come to this. But then we also have another beta which is called unlevered beta. Unlevered beta. The opposite of levered is unlevered. Equity beta. This is not called, so the, the two names for unlevered beta, well, the unlevered beta is one name. The second name is called Asset beta, asset. The unlevered beta or the asset beta are calculated based on the assumption that what would be the company's real beta if it has no debt. So it takes out, filters out the impact of company's debt. Do you get my point? The unlevered beta is calculated on the basis of equity beta for sure, but filtering out, taking away, throwing out the impact of debt from the company's capital structure. So primarily, the unlevered beta is calculated based on the assumption that company has no debt at all. So how would companies, generally every company borrows. And when you calculate the beta, it shows the, the levered levered or equity or regression beta, but sometimes we are interested to know, hey, imagine this company has no debt. How would it beta look like? If you want to fulfill your this wish, it means you are going to calculate unlevered beta. Make sense or not? Yeah? Yes or no? Unlevered beta, you calculate to know how would the company's beta look like if it has no debt? It's a theoretical beta. Now, in reality, imagine there's a company with no debt at all. In reality, company doesn't borrow. Neither short-term borrowing nor long-term borrowings. Believe me, if you can, the levered and unlevered beta would be same because there's no debt. But the fact of the matter is that most of the companies in the world, they do borrow, they have leverage. And that is why the levered and unlevered beta would not be the same. And the formula is very simple. You have the equity or levered beta or, and this is the formula, but we are more, normally we first calculate equity beta and then, un, okay, let me call in levered and unlevered words. Normally we calculate levered beta first and then unlevered beta. All right, it means that I, I want to see unlevered on the left side. So no problem, we can see. It means that the unlevered beta is equal to levered beta divided by bracket starts one plus one minus corporate tax rates time debt to equity ratio. So if I have to rewrite it, Is equal to the 
distribution divide by uh, one plus one minus cos of x square multiplied by that cube as it is. Yeah, debt to equity ratio, D to E ratio. It's a leverage ratio. I explained a few times then that in the empirical research, uh, we show the debt to, we show the leverage of the company by D to E ratio, debt to equity ratio. Mm -hmm. Make sense or not? Yeah, yep, yes or no? The leverage, the lever, the leverage, the, 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 the debt is measured by D to E ratio. D is debt. Debt means your, uh, your long-term debt and short-term debt, and E is the equity. Isn't? D to E ratio, yeah? Now, we go to the, let me take a pause first. Have a look at this spreadsheet. Uh, We have a company called Microsoft. We have their closing prices. We have the NASDAQ index value. Based on that, we find out the Microsoft stock return. You know the formula, how to do it? The current price minus the previous price, bracket close, divide by the previous price. The same thing I do for the index, yeah, you get my point? And then we find out the beta, which is slope of uh, the company's stock return over the market return. I think till now, the story is neat and clean. This beta, 1.15, what are the other names of this beta, this 1.15? Say it loud. This is equity beta. Regression beta and levered beta. Very good. Now, this beta is based, this calculated on the assumption that the company do borrow. But sometimes we're interested that, hey, why don't we take out the impact of debt out? Why don't you have an imaginary company which is fully based on equity, no external funding, all equity? We may be interested in knowing this kind of situation. That is why this unlevered beta is not reality. It's only a scenario. Just imagine a scenario, situation, when there's no debt. Huh? Because we want to see how much systematic risk has been contributed by debt. If look, if I may, if I look at this beta 1.15. This seems to be very high beta, isn't it? This looks like, goodness me, it's a huge beta. So if I'm a risk averse investor or a risk neutral investor, it's not good for me. But then I would be interested to know what contributes this beta to go so high. Then I read or I recall that one of my teacher used to study, discuss about unlevered beta, all right? But then I need to find out the information about it. Look, all these figures are real. The company's profit before tax is 23,149 million dollars profit, which means 23 billion approximately. This is company's profit. And this is company's profit before tax. You know, before tax, the company is paying $1,945 million tax. 
and look at that i divide the tax paid by the company divide by the company's profit before tax and guess what i get i get effective tax rate there's a difference between tax rate and effective tax rate if you google because this is an american company yeah if you google corporate tax rate in in the usa it could be 11% 12% i don't know and i don't care what i care is how much tax microsoft is paying the real tax not the headline tax not the published tax figure in the office of tax department what is the actual tax the company has paid and when i divide the actual tax paid by the actual profit before tax then i get the figure called etr effective tax rate and that is 8.40% i write everything in coefficients not in not in uh, you know percentages and then i find out the company's debt is uh, about 86 billion dollars company's equity equity means the stock shareholders capital is 72 billion dollars and then i calculate guess what d to e ratio debt to equity ratio and this is 1.19 which means that for every 1 dollar of share capital microsoft has a debt of dollar 1.19 and then i put all these numbers in this formula and i put it here and i get unlevered beta which means that which means that had microsoft not carrying any debt and had it been fully financed by the equity microsoft's beta would have been i'm not saying is would have been 0.5 5 and because of enormous amount of debt look at the debt the company's debt is more than equity and because of this this situation is a big jump from 0.55 to 1.15 i can say that if the company's debt was not so high less than the gap between levered beta and unlevered beta would be narrow but because of uh, the company's enormous amount of debt the gap between uh, the gap between the levered beta and the unlevered beta is 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 enormous huge and we also call this beta as as what as what asset beta because we are taking away the impact of debt hence we are taking away the impact of the liability side therefore this beta is also called asset beta so in other words in plain simple straightforward words if microsoft had zero debt its beta would have been 0.55 but because of huge debt systematic risk is also huge this company could have been a good choice for a risk hater investor risk averse investor but thanks to its debt now this is not a choice of a risk hater investor it's a risk lovers investors choice now that's all about uh that's all about the unlevered beta so we have done the uh, unlevered beta we have done levered beta first then unlevered beta uh, now it's a uh, good time to study what factors do contribute towards the beta what factors make beta high or low uh the nature of the product or services offered by the company uh those companies which are providing the products and services throughout the year uh, consistently uh, they have comparatively low beta 
whereas those companies whose demand of the products and services is cyclical, seasonal, they often experience high beta. Uh, for example, I would say that uh, the beta of uh, the beta of the oil company compared with the beta of ice cream making company, uh, the latter would be high beta. Why? Because we consume oil throughout the year, but the ice cream, we don't consume so much in, in the winter time. So it's like cyclical thing. So those companies whose demand is cyclical, seasonal, uh, the beta is high. I would say the beta of a company which offers the holiday homes to the tourists is also high because people travel more during the summertime um, and then they can have the cottages near the, uh, near the seaside. Look at the Finland, uh, the, the, the Finnish coast. Uh, you look at the prices of the cottages during summertime. They all are fully booked, but if you go now, there'll be hardly anybody there, right? So the cash flow is, is very cyclical. Uh, the luxury goods beta is often uh, higher than the necessities. You know, in economics, we have three types of goods, uh, necessities, comforts, and the luxuries. But the comfort is in between. The more extremes are necessities and the luxuries. And I chose these two companies, for example, the first energy is an energy company, right? In, 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 in the UK. And I saw the beta of this company, it was 0 0.17, 0 0.17. And then I saw Taylor Wimpy's beta, which makes luxury homes. Uh, they sell houses, apartments, but who are their buyers? Their buyers are Hollywood actors or the richy rich football stars. And they sell the houses or the rent the cottages in Dubai, in Bahamas, and all those exotic places. And guess what? I, once I saw the beta, it was 3.71. 3.71. Normally, the luxury goods have the higher beta than the necessities. Why not? Why, why like this? Because people, for necessities, they buy them, the demand is consistently. I mean, we don't start eating more when the price of rice goes down and we, stop, we don't stop consuming rice when the price goes up. But of course, when Ferrari becomes expensive, more expensive than the normal, we can wait for it, right? So the, the cash flow is more inconsistent for the luxury products than the necessities. Uh, third point is similar to the second point, and the, normally the growth companies, they have a high beta than the value-based companies. The growth companies have high beta because they invest a lot in idea, R&D, in intellectual capital, intangible assets, which if mature, can make your profits very high. But if they flop, down to zero. Risk of return on intellectual capital is high. That, that is why the growth company like technology or the media uh, companies or this uh, R&D companies, uh, they have normally higher beta than, for example, IKEA. Or the beta is very low because it's very consistent. Um, one more leverage. Uh, we have discussed uh, Financial leverage, yeah? Uh, remember the financial leverage we have done? Uh, the financial leverage was your uh, unlevered beta, right? But we also have one more leverage called operating leverage. Operating leverage is very easy to find, very easy to calculate. Operating leverage shows what percentage of your fixed cost you have to your variable cost. You know, we have two types of costs, fixed cost and variable cost. All right, and we want to see how these costs are changing. And the formula, the easy formula, is the percentage change in EBIT divided by the percentage change in revenue. Why? Because both are calculated after you deduct the cost. EBIT is what? The earnings before interest and tax. Right, the earnings before interest and tax. 
And what do we call it? We call it in simple words, operating profit. Operating profit is EBIT. Mm -hmm. EBIT is the operating profit. And the revenue is the revenue, your sales revenue basically. So if we can find percentage change in EBIT divide by percentage change in revenue, and if this ratio is more than one, if this ratio is more than one, uh, your operating leverage is good. If it is below one, not so good. And how do we calculate it? Simple. We have the data. Uh, on the one extreme, I have company sales revenue, yeah? And the change in sales, you can see here, 37.55 uh, come from 2000 divide, minus 1454 divide by 145. The way we calculate stock return, basically. So the current year minus the previous year, bracket closes, divide by the previous year. So we are finding the percentage change. Remember, we need percentage change, not the actual, but the change. Mm -hmm. So the same thing we do here, EBIT, 98, 127, and then here we find uh, the percentage change in the EBIT. Mm -hmm. And how do we find it? 127, bracket starts, 127, minus 98, bracket closes, divide by 98 is this. And just like before, the current EBIT minus previous EBIT in brackets, divide by, the previous EBIT, and then we can find out this one. And if you don't want to com compare one year, you can find the average. So the average nine years uh, change in revenue is 32.58. The average change in the EBIT is 34.94. And when I divide, what is the formula? of operating leverage, well, the percentage change in EBIT divide by the percentage change in the sales revenue. 34.94 divide by 32.58. I don't have to calculate for sure, the number would be more than one. If it is so, you have done good job. It means that you are operating, look at the word, operating leverage. It's about companies' operations. The other bit, uh, the other leverage that we did was financial leverage. That was about companies' financing. Financing means debt to equity. Here, we are talking about the company's operational performance. If a company's opera operational beta or operating beta, sometimes people call it operating beta, uh, is more than one, good job. Less than one, not so good job. Apparently here, well, you can calculate for each year separately if you wish to, but here, for the sake of simplicity, I took the average of all years here and average of all years here, and then find the average of EBIT, change in EBIT divided by average of change in revenue. Apparently, it's more than one, good job. All right, it's quite simple. And that's what you need to do um, for your companies as well. So take one company, all right, uh, compare the, calculate the company's EBIT. You don't have to calculate, you can see from the income statement, quite simple. Uh, look at the company's uh, sales revenue, that's also in the income statement. Calculate it for the last four or five years and just calculate change change in EBIT, change in sales revenue, and then see if the operating leverage is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So uh, that's enough for today.